all the material we've covered thus far, a strong connection between nutrition and health has been identified. Chapter 18 continues this review, focusing on the relationship with nutrition and chronic disease. Chronic disease develops over a lifetime, typically as a result of metabolic abnormalities that occur within the body. These are induced by not just diet and nutrition, but also by genetics, age, gender, and lifestyle choices. Before we examine the common chronic diseases in the United States, as well as most developed countries, we're going to take a look at the immune system and its inflammatory response. What you'll see is that this inflammatory response underlies many chronic diseases. A strong immune system depends on adequate nutrition. Both under as well as over nutrition can have negative effects on the immune system. Our body's first line of defense to deter foreign substances include the skin, mucous membranes, and the GI tract. If these barriers fail, however, the cells of the immune system become active. Those foreign substances that gain entry into the body are known as antigens. These antigens include bacteria, viruses, toxins, as well as allergens. Of the trillions of cells in the body, one in every 100 is a white blood cell. The two types of white blood cells critical in the immune response are phagocytes and lymphocytes. Phagocytes, which include macrophages and neutrophils, are the first to attack an antigen by ingesting and destroying the invader. During this process, phagocytes also secrete proteins, which are known as cytokines, and these activate and direct the immune response further. The other category of white blood cells are the lymphocytes, of which there are also two types. B cells are produced in the bone marrow, and they specifically will synthesize antibodies. Antibodies travel through the bloodstream to the site of an infection and kill or inactivate antigens so phagocytes can then come and ingest them. T cells are made by the thymus gland and are more specific. They attack only certain fungi, viruses, parasites, as well as a few types of bacteria. They also play an important role, however, in destroying cancer cells. To keep our immune system working at its best, nutrition is of the utmost importance. We rely on adequate dietary protein to maintain our epithelial cells and mucous membranes, proteins also necessary to synthesize antibodies. Omega-3 fatty acids help to decrease inflammation. Vitamin A is necessary to maintain epithelial cells and is important also in producing antibodies. Vitamin D helps to regulate the T cell response. Vitamin C and E are powerful antioxidants protecting against oxidative damage. The B vitamins, 6, 12, and folic acid, as well as the minerals selenium and zinc are also considered to be critical in maintaining our immune function. So what's the connection then between the immune system and chronic disease? Well, the immune response to infection or injury is inflammation. The blood supply to the affected area increases and blood vessels become more permeable. This allows for easy access for the white blood cells, specifically the phagocytes, to travel to the area. Here they engulf the microbe releasing oxidative molecules that kill the invader. In this acute phase, inflammation fights off infection and helps with recovery. However, when the inflammatory process is chronic, there are harmful results. Cells of chronically inflamed tissues produce cytokines, oxidative molecules or free radicals, and blood clotting factors. These sustain the inflammatory response, 
causing the body to damage itself. Now here's the connection with chronic disease. Obesity causes chronic inflammation, resulting in damage to tissues and cells. As we review the chronic diseases, you'll continuously see how obesity is an underlying factor. This bar graph shows the 10 leading causes of death in the United States. Many factors affect the development of these diseases, including physical inactivity, obesity, smoking, as well as alcohol consumption. Diet also plays a powerful role. Out of the 10 diseases noted, four have been identified as having a strong correlation with diet or nutrition. These include heart disease, cancer, strokes, and diabetes. Another important observation is the interrelationships among chronic diseases. What you can see from this particular figure is that some diseases are risk factors for other chronic diseases. Notice that again, obesity is often at the center of these relationships and it is referred to as a gateway disease. The major cause of death, not only in the United States, but other industrialized countries as well, is cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease includes diseases of the heart and blood vessels, with coronary heart disease being the most common form. The major contributing condition is known as atherosclerosis, which involves the accumulation of lipids as well as other materials in the arteries which form plaque. A major component of atherosclerosis is abnormal or specifically elevated blood lipids. There are steps involved in the development of atherosclerosis, which is also referred to as hardening of the arteries. First, fatty streaks accumulate along arterial walls. They gradually enlarge and harden with cholesterol, other lipids, as well as calcium. They become encased in fibrous connective tissue, forming what are known as plaques. Here you can see how plaque buildup appears in an artery. As the plaque accumulates, the artery narrows, affecting blood flow as well as the delivery of oxygen and nutrients to the heart muscle. The next step in the development of atherosclerosis involves inflammation. The immune system becomes activated as plaque is perceived by the body as tissue damage. This in turn increases the inflammatory process. The immune system will send out macrophages, which attempt to engulf the LDL cholesterol particles but then they themselves become incorporated into the plaque. Free radicals are produced, which causes further cell damage. Arterial damage and the inflammatory response also favors the formation of blood clots. As clots enlarge, blood flow to tissue decreases even further. If a clot breaks loose from an artery wall and travels, it can completely cut off blood flow leading to a heart attack or stroke. Because the inflammatory response can lead to serious consequences, researchers have identified signs or markers of inflammation in blood vessel walls. One marker is C-reactive protein or CRP. This is a protein release during the acute phase of infection or inflammation. The presence of this protein may be used to assess the risk of an impending heart attack or stroke. Another marker is lipoprotein-associated phospholipase A2. This marker of inflammation can be used to identify plaques, which are most likely to rupture. The final step to note in the development of atherosclerosis is an increase in blood pressure and in this instance, it's referred to as being a self-accelerating process. Arteries cannot expand due to plaque buildup. They've hardened. 
This causes an increase in blood pressure. As blood pressure increases, it damages arteries even further. By age 20, half of the adults in the United States have at least one major risk factor for cardiovascular disease or coronary heart disease. Regular screenings of blood lipid levels and lifestyle choices have been shown to be successful, though, in lowering the death rate from these collective diseases. Risk factors have been identified as being either non-modifiable or modifiable. Non-modifiable are the ones we can't change and include age, gender, and family history. Therefore, we should focus on those that are modifiable or the ones we can change. These include blood lipid levels as well as blood pressure. For one who has diabetes, specifically type 2 diabetes, this means controlling glucose levels. Keeping our weight in check to avoid obesity an overall diet certainly plays a role. The risk increases with what's known as an atherogenic diet, which is a diet high in saturated fat while low in vegetable, fruit, and whole grains. In this table, all of the factors highlighted in yellow are those which have a relationship with diet. Physical activity and smoking are also considered to be modifiable risk factors. Since blood lipid levels, blood pressure, and body weight are considered risk factors for cardiovascular disease and coronary heart disease, standards have been developed to assist with screening. Total blood cholesterol levels, the cholesterol portion of LDLs and HDLs, as well as triglyceride, are noted here as to whether they are considered to be desirable, borderline, or high risk. BMI and blood pressure are also noted according to the same designations. Diabetes is considered a major independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease and coronary heart disease. Blood vessels become damaged from elevated glucose levels and inflammation increases. This results in the progression of atherosclerosis and the increased development of plaque. Smoking is another major risk factor. It damages the heart by increasing blood pressure. It decreases oxygen being distributed, it damages platelets, and it increases the risk of blood clots. Obesity and physical activity also play a role. Obesity, especially abdominal obesity, or what we refer to as central obesity, and lack of physical activity can have a dramatic effect. With regular activity, one can increase their HDL levels, decrease their LDL levels, improve overall insulin sensitivity, and decrease blood pressure. The overall risk of cardiovascular disease and coronary heart disease increases with one who has a cluster of these noted modifiable risk factors. Any combination of insulin resistance, high blood pressure, abnormal blood lipids, and abdominal obesity is referred to as metabolic syndrome. There are also the non-modifiable risk factors associated with cardiovascular disease and coronary heart disease, or simply the ones we can't control or can't change. Age is a significant risk factor for men at age 45 and for women at 55. While atherosclerosis progression increases after these ages, controlling other risk factors such as weight, blood lipids, blood pressure can all be beneficial. At every age, men have a greater risk of cardiovascular disease and coronary heart disease than women. They tend to experience elevations in LDL levels and blood pressure at an earlier age as well as having higher levels of homocysteine. This is an amino acid produced in the body that may damage artery walls and increase overall oxidative stress. A history of early cardiovascular disease or coronary heart disease in immediate family members also increases the risk. 
The more family members that are affected and the earlier the age of onset of disease, the greater the risk. Now that we've reviewed the risk factors that can contribute to cardiovascular disease as well as coronary heart disease, what can we do? Well, the first thing to start off with is maintaining a healthy body weight or a healthy BMI. Emphasizing a diet which is high in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, low-fat dairy, poultry, fish, legumes, and nuts can also be beneficial. Limiting consumption of red meat, added sugars and sweets, as well as sugar-sweetened beverages is recommended. Limiting saturated and trans fat. If you recall from chapter five, these are the types of fats that tend to be solid at room temperature. Include omega-3s. Omega-3 fatty acids are found in fish, walnuts, flax seeds, among some other foods. Include fiber-rich foods. Fiber has been shown to potentially help decrease cholesterol levels. Reduce sodium intake to help control blood pressure. Control alcohol intake, limiting to no more than two drinks a day for males, one for females. Include regular physical activity and avoid smoking. For one concerned about cardiovascular disease or coronary heart disease and the underlying atherosclerosis associated with those, hypertension also requires consideration then. Hypertension or high blood pressure affects one in three adults in the United States, contributing to one million heart attacks and 800,000 strokes per year. But what is blood pressure, or more specifically, what does it represent? Blood pressure is equal to cardiac output times peripheral resistance. Cardiac output being the heart muscle contractions that pump blood away from the heart. Peripheral resistance refers to the resistance that blood then encounters in the small arterial branches that carry blood to the tissue. These are referred to as arterioles. If there is either an increase in cardiac output or an increase in peripheral resistance, blood pressure increases. Cardiac output may increase when heart rate or blood volume increases. Peripheral resistance is affected by the diameter of the arterioles. Blood pressure has been found to be regulated by the nervous system, which in turn regulates heart muscle contractions as well as the diameter of the arterioles. Hormonal signals also play a role, helping to regulate fluid retention or blood vessel constriction. The kidneys play a major role in this process. Several risk factors have been identified leading to the development of hypertension. First, age. Hypertension risk increases with age. It's estimated that two thirds of the population greater than 65 years of age have an elevated blood pressure. Physical activity also comes into play, increasing the risk even further. As far as genetics, hypertension risk is similar among family members, and it's also been found to be more prevalent in certain ethnic groups. African Americans in particular have been found to have an elevated risk of developing hypertension. Obesity plays a major role. An estimated 60% of those diagnosed with hypertension fall under the weight classification of being obese. Sodium intake also can affect the development of hypertension. High dietary sodium can lead to fluid retention as well as the increase in blood pressure. Alcohol also plays a role. The risk increases with males consuming more than two servings a day and females consuming more than one serving per day. Smoking can damage arteries as well as affecting peripheral resistance, which in turn can elevate blood pressure. Having elevations in blood cholesterol levels or LDL levels also increases the risk of hypertension. Recommendations then to reduce the risk of hypertension would include, first of all, weight control. 
Even a modest weight loss of 5 to 10% of body weight can significantly decrease blood pressure. Achieving and maintaining a healthy BMI should be the goal. Physical activity can not only help with weight control, but moderate types of aerobic activity, such as brisk walking 30 to 60 minutes per day, can decrease blood pressure. In addition, resistance training two to three days per week can also reduce blood pressure. Limiting alcohol to the acceptable amounts for males and females and avoiding smoking and tobacco use are also recommendations. There's a specific diet guideline which has been developed to significantly help lower blood pressure. And this is known as the DASH diet, dietary approaches to stop hypertension. It focuses on fruits, vegetables, low-fat dairy, lean meats, whole grains, and nuts. It's also low in saturated fat as well as sodium. In addition to lowering blood pressure, this diet guideline has also been found to help reduce total cholesterol, LDL levels, as well as decreasing overall body inflammation. Here we can see the effects of these recommendations on blood pressure levels. Each modification shows the expected decrease which may occur with the systolic blood pressure, which is the upper number in the blood pressure reading. Systolic represents the force of blood against artery walls as your heart beats. There are also additional dietary sources which may help to lower blood pressure. The minerals, potassium, calcium, and magnesium, and the foods which contain them are beneficial. Anthocyanins, which are pigments found in certain foods which provide a red or purplish color, can also be beneficial. Anthocyanins are found in foods such as blueberries, cherries, strawberries, as well as hibiscus tea. Probiotics, those live microbes that we discussed back in chapter three, they're found typically in foods such as yogurt and cottage cheese. Nitrates also can be beneficial. These are natural chemicals that are converted to nitric oxide in the body that helps increase blood flow. Now it's important to note that these nitrates, these natural nitrates, are not the same as the synthetic nitrates which are added to processed meats. Foods which have a larger amount of natural, nat natural nitrates include arugula, spinach, rhubarb, and beets. The next chronic disease to address is diabetes mellitus. Diabetes is a metabolic disorder characterized by elevated blood glucose, which is referred to as hyperglycemia. This elevated glucose is associated either with insufficient insulin, ineffective insulin, or possibly a combination of both. An estimated 29 million Americans have been diagnosed with diabetes, with another 86 million having pre-diabetes. This is a condition which has elevated glucose, but it's not yet high enough to diagnose true diabetes. It's the seventh leading cause of death in the United States, and it contributes significantly to the risk of heart disease and kidney disease. Treatment for diabetes focuses on the coordination of diet, along with possible medications, as well as the incorporation of physical activity to control blood glucose levels and manage weight. The incidence of diabetes has increased dramatically in recent years. From this particular depiction, we could see the increase in just over the course of 10 years, specifically from 2004 to 2014. Looking at this map of the United States, focus solely on those that are darkest red or maroonish in color. In 2004, there were only two states which had greater than 9% of their population diagnosed with diabetes. In 2014, just 10 years later, there are 27 states 
with greater than 9% of their population diagnosed with diabetes. We're now several years past that last depiction, so you can imagine how the incidence has increased even further. In this table, we see the differences between the two main types of diabetes, type 1 and type 2. While the development differs, the possible health complications are the same. Type 1 is the less common form, accounting for about 5 to 10 percent of all cases. The pancreas loses its ability to synthesize insulin, which is the hormone necessary to allow cells to take up glucose. Type 1 is considered an autoimmune disorder, where immune cells attack and destroy the beta cells of the pancreas, which produce insulin. There may also be a viral or genetic connection to the development of this particular type. The those who are diagnosed with type 1 must receive insulin either by injection or from an external pump. Insulin cannot be taken orally because it is a protein and the enzymes of the GI tract would digest it. Type 2 is the more common form, accounting for 90 to 95% of all cases. In fact, the increase in diabetes that we saw on the previous map was predominantly type 2 diabetes. The primary defect in type 2 is insulin resistance or a reduced sensitivity to insulin. Insulin is unable to cross the cell membranes, so glucose levels remain high. The pancreas continues to synthesize insulin, and these insulin levels can climb and lead to a condition known as hyperinsulinemia. Eventually, the beta cells become exhausted, leading to decreased insulin production. The use of insulin therapy then depends on the individual situation. While factors such as age and genetics may increase the risk of type 2 diabetes, the greatest connection is with obesity. Another alarming note is that the incidence of type 2 diabetes is increasing significantly in children and adolescents in the United States. And this is thought to be directly related to the increase in those who are overweight or obese. Classic symptoms of diabetes include excessive thirst, excessive urination, the presence of glucose in the urine, increased appetite, hyperglycemia or high blood glucose levels, as well as weight loss, although weight loss will only occur with a type 1 diabetic. There is also an increased production of ketones or ketone bodies. Now glucose is high in the bloodstream, but it can't enter the cells. Remember, insulin is either insufficient or ineffective at this point. The cells are looking for a source of energy, so they turn to fat to be broken down. This is done in such a way which produces ketones. While ketones can be used as a source of energy, as their production increases and builds up, it leads to ketosis. This in turn can alter the acid-base balance of the body. As the body becomes more acidic or goes into a state known as ketoacidosis, the severe result is referred to as a diabetic coma. In both types of diabetes, glucose can't enter cells and the result is elevated blood glucose levels. This can lead to both acute as well as chronic complications. Take a moment to review figure 18.4 here, which summarizes the metabolic consequences which may occur with uncontrolled or untreated diabetes. You'll see that since some glucose may get into cells with a type 2 diabetic, many of the symptoms or complications related to type 1 diabetes may not occur. Let's take a closer look at some of these possible complications of uncontrolled or untreated diabetes. The first to note are the diseases of large blood vessels. As previously noted, atherosclerosis tends to develop early and be more severe in diabetics. The interrelationship with 
insulin resistance, obesity, hypertension, and atherosclerosis explains why about 75% of people with diabetes will die as a result of cardiovascular disease. Control of blood glucose has been shown to reduce this risk significantly. Then there are diseases of the small blood vessels. These are the capillaries. As the capillaries in particular of the kidney and eyes are affected, the resulting complications can be kidney failure and blindness. Nerve tissue may also be affected by diabetes. One may first experience a prickling or tingling sensation, especially in the arms and legs. Later, loss of sensation in the hands and feet may occur. Injuries to these areas may not be noted, leading to possible infections. With loss of nerve function coupled with decreased circulation, undetected injury or infection may lead to tissue death or gangrene. In some cases, amputation of the affected area may be necessary. Here are the typical lab values used to diagnose diabetes as well as pre-diabetes. A fasting plasma glucose level or a hemoglobin A1C level may be used in the diagnosis process. A fasting plasma glucose test measures plasma glucose after a person has fasted for at least eight hours to determine whether current glucose levels are within the normal range. The hemoglobin A1C test measures the percentage of a person's hemoglobin that has glucose attached to it. The higher the percentage, the higher a person's blood glucose levels have been over a period of time. Because red blood cells typically live for about three months, the hemoglobin A1C test provides a long-term evaluation of overall glucose control. Diet is an important component of diabetes treatment. The American Diabetes Association approves a variety of eating patterns that can be used to manage diabetes. These include the DASH diet, Mediterranean diet, as well as a plant-based diet. The percentage of calories from carbohydrate, fat, and protein are similar to the dietary guidelines for Americans, with adjustments being made based on the individual. Of the three energy yielding nutrients, carbohydrate is the most important to consume according to a consistent pattern. As you recall, carbohydrates are broken down into individual glucose units. Spacing carbohydrate intake throughout the day helps to maintain appropriate blood glucose levels and also maximizes the effects of insulin or oral hypoglycemic meds. Eating too much carbohydrate at one time can cause blood glucose levels to spike, putting a strain on insulin production and especially the beta cells which produce the insulin in the pancreas. Eating too little can lead to low blood glucose levels or hypoglycemia. From chapter four, we reviewed sources of carbohydrate. And as you recall, they include grains themselves, as well as any products made from grains, starchy vegetables, such as potatoes, corn, and peas, non-starchy vegetables, such as lettuce, cucumber, broccoli, tomatoes, and so forth, also contain carbohydrate, but at a very minimal amount. Fruit and fruit juice, milk and yogurt are also significant sources of carbohydrate. Cheese being a dairy product, however, is not a significant contributor of carbohydrate. Dried peas and soy products also contribute carbohydrate. Obviously, any type of a sweet or snack food, such as sodas, cake, cookies, candy, also are a source of carbohydrate. When selecting processed foods as a diabetic, it's important to check labels. As a general guideline, if a food contains more than nine grams of sugar per serving, it is not the best choice. When selecting grains, it's important to choose those which are noted as whole grains. 
This is the intact grain with a higher fiber content present. These have been shown to have moderate effects on blood glucose compared to highly processed or starchy foods, which can raise glucose more quickly and to a higher level. The recommended fiber intake for a diabetic is 35 to 40 grams per day. Avoiding foods and beverages with added sugars is also important. Since added sugars are in a mono or disaccharide form, they are easily digested and released, causing increases in blood glucose levels. Dietary fat recommendations are the same as for the general population and include reducing saturated fat to less than 10% of total calories. Trans fats, which include those manufactured fats which are hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated, should be avoided. Foods rich in omega-3s should be included in the diet. These have a beneficial effect on lipoprotein levels as well as inflammation. Therefore, they can actually help to prevent heart disease. Protein recommendations are also the same as with the general population. However, if a diabetic has developed kidney disease, protein intake may need to be modified. Alcohol should only be consumed in moderation and only in those who have controlled blood glucose levels. There are important points to note for overall disease management of the type 1 diabetic. People with type 1 diabetes produce no insulin or little insulin. They must adjust the amount and schedule of their insulin doses based on meals, physical activity, and overall health status. Self-testing of blood glucose levels is critical for overall control. To help maintain optimal nutritional status, one needs to include consistent intake of carbohydrate with appropriate spacing. Achieve blood lipid levels within desirable ranges. Control blood pressure as well as prevent and treat complications. Physical activity is an important component for overall health and can certainly be included in the lifestyle of a type 1 diabetic. A general guideline is to have carbohydrate-rich foods readily available during as well as after activity to avoid possible hypoglycemia or low blood sugar. It's recommended to check blood glucose before as well as after physical activity to identify when adjustments to insulin or food intake is needed. With a type 2 diabetic, blood glucose may be controlled by diet alone or with diet combined with an oral hypoglycemic medication. Oral hypoglycemics work in various ways. Some may reduce glucose released by the liver. Some will increase the ability of the pancreas to release insulin. There are others that may increase the body's own response to insulin or may also help delay carbohydrate digestion, as well as the absorption and release of glucose. Insulin is contraindicated in a type 2 diabetic if the issue is insulin resistance. Giving additional insulin while levels are already high will just allow more storage of fat. Since the majority of type 2 diabetics are usually overweight or obese, you can see why this is not recommended. Even moderate weight loss of 10 to 20 pounds has been found to improve overall insulin resistance as well as having an effect on blood lipids and blood pressure. Together with diet, a regular routine of physical activity not only supports weight loss and weight control, but continues to favorably affect blood lipid and blood pressure levels. The last chronic disease we'll review in chapter 18 is cancer. Cancer is a disease in which cells multiply out of control, forming masses that disrupt normal body functions. It's not a single disorder. There are many different cancers with varying characteristics as well as location within the body. Depending on the type and location will determine treatment. Cancer is the second leading cause of death in the United States behind cardiovascular disease. 
Risk factors include diet, environment, genetics, and once again, obesity. As far as the role of diet, there are specific foods which have been identified which may be cancer initiators, those which are promoters, and those which are protective or considered to be anti-promoters. The development of cancer, referred to as carcinogenesis, begins as a single cell loses control of its normal growth and replication process. On the next slide, we'll look at this process visually, which involves the following steps. Carcinogen exposure, entry into the cell, initiation, where cellular DNA is altered, promotion, where the altered cells multiply, and then the formation of a tumor. Here we can clearly see the steps involved in cancer development or carcinogenesis. Normal cells exposed to a carcinogen experience changes in their cellular DNA. As the DNA becomes altered, abnormal cell division occurs, as shown here during the initiation stage. Promoters, factors which favor the development of cancer once initiation has taken place, increases the abnormal cell division. As abnormal cells continue to grow, a tumor forms. This tumor can disrupt the functioning of normal tissue around it. Some of the abnormal cells may be released into the bloodstream or lymphatic system. This results in what is known as metastases. This is the spread of cancer from one area to another. It's estimated that dietary factors may be linked to as many as one third of all cancer diagnoses. Let's take a look at some of these connections with certain foods performing as initiators. Grilling foods, especially meats, over a direct flame causes the fat and the oils to drip onto the fire. This in turn creates carcinogens that can vaporize into the food. Eating these foods then introduces carcinogens into the GI tract. To minimize carcinogen formation, it's suggested to line the grill with foil, wrap the food in foil, or marinate meats prior to cooking. What's been shown is that marinades have been able to reduce the level of carcinogens that are created during the grilling process. Meats which are preserved by smoking, curing, or salting. So as examples, ham, bacon, deli meats, to name a few, can increase the risk of colon cancer. Studies have also shown that a high intake of red meat, regardless of the preservation method, can also increase the risk of colon cancer. Acrylamide is a compound identified as a potential carcinogen. It's formed when foods that have a high starch content, coupled with a specific amino acid, which is known as asparagine, are baked or fried at high temperatures. French fries and potato chips fall under this category. You would most likely have to consume large amounts of these foods for a period of time, but the potential to be exposed to acrylamide is certainly there. Alcohol, another initiator, due to its potential effect of damaging cells, has been strongly correlated to cancer of the mouth, the throat, breast, colon, as well as liver. Once the initiation step has taken place, certain factors may promote or accelerate cancer development. One in particular to note is dietary fat. Animal studies suggest that high fat diets promote cancer, but these studies have been inconclusive in humans. The type of fat, however, may have a greater influence on promotion. A diet high in animal fat, as opposed to plant-based fat, has been shown to be correlated with an increased risk of colon cancer. Fat also causes an increased secretion of bile into the intestine. So another possible connection is that the microorganisms in the gut may possibly convert the bile to cancer-causing compounds, therefore potentially increasing the risk again of colon as well as rectal cancer. There are dietary factors which are anti-promoters, meaning they oppose or protect against cancer development. 
Diets high in fiber may be protected against colon cancer. Fiber works in different ways. It increases the rate of bile excretion. It may bind potential carcinogens, and it may also help move substances through the colon quickly for excretion. A plant-based diet can also be protective, um, especially one which focuses greatly on fruits and vegetables. Yellow and green fruits and vegetables contain phytochemicals, which have been found to interfere with DNA replication. Cruciferous vegetables. These are vegetables from the cabbage family, so Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, um, broccoli. They contain phytochemicals that activate enzymes, which are known as indoles, that can fight carcinogens. Soybeans and legumes contain protease inhibitors that inactivate enzymes, which help to spread cancer cells. Then those nutrients, which are categorized as being antioxidants, may also be effective vitamin C, vitamin E, beta carotene, as well as selenium. There are also other factors to consider. Environmental factors such as exposure to radiation, sun, water and air pollution, as well as smoking have been shown to play a role in cancer development. Lack of physical activity also has been shown to increase the risk of cancer. Studies have consistently shown that regular physical activity can help decrease the incidence specifically of colon cancer and breast cancer. Obesity itself has a strong correlation with increasing the risk of colon, breast, endometrial, pancreatic, kidney, esophageal, and possibly gallbladder cancers. Taking all this information now into consideration, the recommendations to reduce cancer risk include eat a variety of healthy foods, especially emphasizing plant sources. Include five or more fruits or vegetables every day. Focus on whole grain products, high fiber foods. Limit high fat and processed meat. Avoid foods which are smoked, cured, or salt preserved. Adopt a physically active lifestyle. Maintain a healthy body weight or BMI. Limit consumption of alcoholic beverages and avoid smoking. This chapter discussed four specific chronic diseases, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, diabetes, and cancer. While not all diet recommendations apply equally to all people with these noted diseases, they do support each other. One specific recommendation that is found regardless of disease condition is weight control. The problems of obesity increase when medical conditions develop. For example, if obesity contributes to type 2 diabetes, the risk of cardiovascular disease then increases. If as a population we can get obesity better controlled, the effects of decreasing chronic diseases may follow. In addition to weight control, the other common recommendations across the disease conditions include the limitation on saturated and trans fat, including fiber rich as well as plant-based foods, and the inclusion of regular physical activity. Consumers can find these recommendations incorporated into various eating guidelines, including the USDA food patterns, and my plate, which we reviewed earlier in the course. Another option is the healthy eating plate, which was developed by the Harvard School of Public Health. And this can be reviewed in the textbook. It is noted as figure 18.6. There is one more diet guideline to know, and that's the Mediterranean diet. While we reviewed this all the way back in chapter five, it's definitely worth a revisit. Take a look again at the features, as well as the benefits it provides in decreasing the risk of the chronic diseases we just discussed in Chapter 18.